Okay, well, I think we should make a start. Uh, so, yeah, welcome to this afternoon's uh, Archer webinar, um, which is going to be a double bill between myself, Ian Bethune in Edinburgh, uh, and Matt Watkins at Lincoln. Uh, so, we're going to be talking about various things uh, related to CP2K. Uh, so, some of the things that I want to talk about, I'm going to um, just briefly. Uh, go through the, the CPK 4.1 release and then talk about um, some work that we've been doing here at EPTC, myself and Mark Tucker, uh, looking at performance improvements in various parts of the code. And I'll show you some results of what you can expect with that. And then I'm going to hand over uh, to Matt, who's going to talk about some work that we've been doing uh, with Sergey at Lincoln uh, on time to DFT. So that's the, uh, the order for today. Um, so I think uh, from the names I recognize in the, uh, the chat room, uh, most of you already know uh, what CP2K is, um, but for the benefit of people who might view later, um, so CP2K is a, a, an atomistic simulation program that can do a whole bunch of uh, different types of simulations using different force models all the way from classical through DFT, which is the popular use of CP2K, uh, through to some more expensive and more accurate uh, methods that people might be familiar with from uh, computational chemistry codes. Um, and in particular on Archer, it's the second most heavily used code on the system. And um, so there's quite a large number of users uh, based here in the UK. Uh, again, another list of some of the, the things that, that you can do with CP2K. And the nice part of it really being that it's quite flexible and you can uh, combine different force models with various uh, MD and other simulation type tools. I know there's various things including the time invented DFT uh, and other, other things for uh, spectroscopies, uh, vibrational analysis calculations and other things like that. So, uh, so CP2K 4.1 uh, is the, the most recently uh, released version of CP2K. So it came out at the beginning of October uh, and was uh, installed in Archer shortly afterwards. Uh, it's now the default version there, so if you uh, just do module load CP2K or you have that in your scripts, um, then since uh, mid-October you'll have got the new release uh, version. Uh, the previous releases uh, are still there. You can select them um, by module load CP2K followed by the version number, um, but really there's very little reason why you uh, might want to uh, some of the things uh, which are, are new in 4.1, uh, there's really is quite a, a number of, uh, of small features. Uh, the link there to the version history page on the CPK website will give you all of them. Um, but some of the more interesting ones, uh, so there is a, a population analysis tool uh, called Modified Atomic Orbitals, uh, which is recently implemented in the code that's there. Uh, there is an interface to a separate code called OMEN for doing uh, transport, uh, quantum transport calculations. Uh, so this is the, uh, the implementation which was uh, nominated for uh, or submitted for a Gordon Bell Award at last year's supercomputing conference. Uh, there's a number of uh, improvements to the linear scaling BFT code. Uh, so there's uh, the polarized atomic orbitals method. Uh, and also a new optimizer called, uh, called Curvy Steps. And um, so if you use linear scaling BFT, I want to try some of those things. Uh, there is a cubic scaling implementation of the random phase approximation. Uh, so this is uh, a highly expensive uh, but accurate uh, method for approximating electronic correlation energies. Uh, there have been various improvements, uh, I would say ongoing improvements still to the uh, the K points code, which is a reasonably recent function uh, added to CPTK. Um, so, if you do want to try out using K point uh, K points to your calculations, then I would suggest going to this uh, FAQ page on the website, and that will give you the latest kind of what's implemented and what's not. Um, and if you find things that are not working in that area of the code, um, then please you know, post to the uh, CPTK mailing list um, and. You get an answer as to what's not working, or if you find a bug code that can get fixed. Uh, one of the other major sort of functionality that's in the 4.1 release uh, 
is the time dependent DFT, um, which Max is going to talk more about later on. Um, alongside that, there's a whole bunch of uh, bug fixes, and um, most of the performance improvements I'm about to talk about are also in the 4.1 release. Uh, so I would recommend um, looking forward to using it if you're not already doing so. Uh, a couple of other bits of information. Uh, I hope many of you have already seen uh, via various mailing lists and the, the uh, 2017 edition of the C2K user group meeting uh, will be on the 9th of January. Uh, so it's quite early in the year um, and it's also up in Edinburgh this year. Uh, I suppose the previous year, so it's been hosted in London. Uh, your cutter from Zurich is coming over uh, to give the uh, the keynote talk there, but there'll also be a number of other talks uh, on particular applications of CPUK um, and some talks on particular uh, methods. So we're going to focus on giving you useful information about how to use the code rather than uh, telling you what people have done with it. And as in previous years, which I think has been quite popular, uh, there'll be the option to be able to give uh, three minute lightning talks about their work as well. So uh, I suggest. Uh, Look that up, and if you're able to come, uh, please register. And there's travel funding available for people um, in order to help you get up to Edinburgh. Uh, also worth saying that um, there is still an uh, opportunity to do uh, to get uh, your hands-on CP2K training um, uh, from myself or other people involved in CP2K. Um, so. Many groups around the UK have already benefited from that. We've gone down and run sort of one day or two day workshops with them. Um, if that's something that's of interest to you, um, drop me an email and we can sort something out. Okay, so um, on to the, the, um, the sort of second major section of the webinar. Uh, so this is some of the results from our Archer ECSE project, um, which is just finishing up and um, Mark Tucker has been working on here in Edinburgh with me. Uh, so the first uh, thing we've done in that project, um, so we've been looking at uh, the load balancing code within CP2K. Uh, so this is uh, particularly load balancing of the operations on the real space grids. Uh, so this is a, a key step in the, the Gaussian plane waves method um, where you uh, take Gaussian functions and write them out onto uh, to distributed real space grids uh, ready for uh, FFT and the, the plane wave part of the calculation uh, and then also the inverse. Um, so that can be a bottleneck for some calculations and in particular uh, for calculations where there's uh, some intrinsic load imbalance uh, because the system you're modeling is non-homogeneous um, or for example you have uh, something like a, a molecule or a cluster in a vacuum, for example, or an interface, some of this, where there's different things going different parts of the system, and um, then there's potentially a load imbalance problem there. Now, there is uh, a load balancing algorithm built into CP2K already, um, but it was quite inefficient. Uh, in particular, it scaled uh, the square of the number of processors. Um, so in practice, that meant that for large numbers of processors, which is exactly where you want to do load balancing, uh, the load balancing algorithm had to be turned off by default. Um, so we've uh, rewritten part of that so that now it's uh, a fully MPI parallelized load balancer. Uh, so it's linear scaling in the number of processors, um, which basically means you can use it for uh, much larger uh, size calculations without incurring uh, memory and time costs. Uh, and so now uh, in CQK 4.1, the load balancer is uh, enabled by default uh, no matter how many MPI processes you use. Uh, just to give you an idea, I mean, the, the actual time saving in the load balancer itself, so this top table and the graph there, um, you know, obviously there's, there's quite a significant speed up in the algorithm because it's been parallelized. Um, but even on uh, you know, 96 nodes of Archer, um, the, the, the previous algorithm was only taking five seconds. Uh, so the main benefit of this really is the memory saving and the fact that therefore you can uh, turn on the load balancing uh, at a much larger scale than was possible before. Um, and if you do that, um, the table two there uh, shows you that the load balancer can give you 
in the region of uh, 10% speed up. That's for a uh, calculation uh, with a uh, cluster of water molecules in a, box of, a large box of vacuum. And so it's worth having, and you will get it for free uh, when you run your calculation, unless you have to turn the load balance off. So the second thing that we looked at in this ECSE project uh, was the performance of the Gaussian and augmented plane waves method. Um, so most calculations that people will do with C2K uh, use the Gaussian and plane waves method, um, where uh, your valence orbitals are represented by Gaussian functions, um, and the, uh, the core electrons are considered to be frozen uh, and, and represented by uh, pseudopotentials. So what Gaussian and augmented plane waves does is it introduces uh, these grids, spherical grids around atoms that allow you to numerically uh, represent the, uh, the, the core electrons. Um, so it's allowed you to do uh, things like coil up spectroscopy, for example. Um, but it does uh, introduce some additional computation, obviously, to handle these uh, spherical grids. Um, so in uh, both uh, directions, if you like, of the, the uh, in addition to some Gaussian and plane waves, you have a routine that calculates uh, the density on a real space grid and uh, based on the spherical grids, and then also uh, when building the cone sham matrix, uh, makes updates to the matrix cells uh, based on the interactions of these uh, GNU atoms. Um, so the, the particular aspect of that that we're looking at uh, is the OpenMP parallelization. Um, so most of CPUK now uh, has uh, mixed mode MPI plus OpenMP, and uh, so we've added the OpenMP into uh, GAPW as well. Uh, in addition to that, we also made some uh, improvements to the code along the way. So in practice, uh, for this particular benchmark uh, that we were testing with, which is a reasonably small one, but it, it it's kind of illustrate the kind of speed ups you get. Um, so this is just 32 water molecules uh, at periodic uh, GAPW calculation with a reasonably good quality or fairly good quality basis set. And um, what you can see from uh, table three there uh, is that if you look at the, uh, the second uh, rule, which is the, the original code uh, without the new OpenMP implementations that we've done uh, versus the bottom rule you could get a speed up of about 3.6 times um, using four threads per process. So this is very you know, worthwhile having. And you can see for this kind of calculation um, that using the hybrid MPI OpenMP code is much more efficient uh, than the pure MPI code. Another part of the code also where the uh, OpenMP was not present was in these uh, uh, dispersion corrections, uh, so density functionals uh, or local density functionals do a, a poor job of capturing uh, uh, dispersion interactions. Uh, so there are a bunch of uh, popular corrections as uh, so the Grimmett type air potential corrections, uh, and then also a, a bunch of non-local uh, Van der Waals type uh, corrections, um, which are uh, important for a whole range of, of different systems. Um, just one example uh, in the image on the right there, but uh, the coiling structure of DNA uh, is uh, strongly dependent on how well uh, or whether the Van der Waals interaction is in fact represented at all. Uh, so there was a nice talk at last year's uh, C2K summer school, uh, which shows exactly what's implemented in CP2K in terms of these corrections. I would suggest you go and have a look at that. And what we've done uh, is just to OpenMP parallelize uh, the various routines that are involved in these computations. Um, and again, what you can see here, so this is for a, a calculation of a, a water or nitride interface uh, using this uh, opt B88 van der Waal functional, uh, which comes from, from the LibXC library. Um, so if you, the actual uh, dispersion correction part of the calculation is reasonably small, um, but you can see we've got quite a significant speed up uh, in those particular routines. And what that gives you, again, for free, uh, is about a 5% speed up overall to the calculation. 
Okay, so um, I'm going to stop there talking about performance. Um, I would just say that um, you know, all these things we've talked about are in the CPTK 4.1 release. Um, so do go and uh, try it out. Hopefully you'll see some speed up uh, and you might want to also try uh, revisiting the uh, MDI OpenMD hybrid code if you haven't already done so. Right now, uh, we're going to pass over to Matt, uh, who's going to talk about the TBDF teamwork. So Matt, do you want to screen share and take over? Thanks, Ian. Hopefully this goes smoothly. How is that? Is that? Yeah, it looks good to me. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Matt Watkins. Uh, so I want to talk just a little bit about this. Um, uh, mainly time dependent DFT, uh, but um, generally uh, a little bit of stuff about excited states that is now available in CP2K. Uh, uh, as I say, I'm, I'm Matt Watkins, but really Sergey Cholkov is the guy. Um, I've seen he's just joined, so he's available if anyone's got any questions for him, um, who did all the work on this. Uh, he's done a very good job. Um, just a, a tiny advertisement. We're at Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln is just to the right of the centre of the UK. And this is just to, uh, to point out there's a brand new department of maths and physics here. Um, and hopefully we're going to start doing some nice computational stuff. Uh, add over. Um, so why do we want excited states uh, and why in CP2K? Well, there's a whole bunch of uh, processes. Um, I suppose you could broadly divide them into sort of chemistry and energy processes, um, photochemistry, photocatalysis, solar cell operation. Again, this is interaction of matter with light uh, driving chemical reactions. And the other sort of classic is just spectroscopy, just to be able to identify materials. So there are a lot of reasons why you want to calculate excited states. A lot of quantum chemistry codes can do very, very good jobs for small molecules in a sort of uh, harmonic or sort of semi-static um, uh, approximation. What we want to be able to do with CP2K is to be able to combine the excited state calculations with its abilities to um, perform ab initio molecular dynamics and the various different Hamiltonians that are available. Uh, so it should hopefully be quite a flexible tool. Um, so time dependent DFT, I'm going to skip through these slides very, very quickly. Uh, I'll tidy them up and they'll be made available, uh, as Ian said earlier. Um, so most people um, think of DFT as a ground state theory. But from round about the middle of the 90s, um, after some sort of pioneering work from, uh, oh, well, that paper that's up there is probably one of the more cited ones. Uh, it was appreciated by that by applying a, a, a at least in some sense a, a time dependent um, potential to the system. It's possible to actually access excited states to the system as well. Um, actually, people have been doing this for a long time, maybe even back into the 70s, but it wasn't until this uh, this paper and this reformulation of it as a, a linear response that looked very similar to time-dependent Hartree-Fock theory or to um, some configuration, configuration interaction singles, which was familiar to quantum chemists. And once that happened, it started to be used extensively. Um, I'm going to give just a couple of slides on the theory, but really you're better off uh, going uh, to a textbook or the main uh, original papers on this or a variety of reviews. But it, essentially, instead of the um, non-time dependent uh, Kuhn-Sham equations, we'll set up some time dependent Kuhn-Sham equations. Uh, and they can be solved in two very different ways. One is a linear response approximation. So we have a small 
uh, time varying uh, electric field applied to the system causes a linear response and then you can uh, solve for the, um, uh, the perturbed states of the system which are the excitation modes of the uh, system. There's another different way of doing things which is so-called real-time propagation where you explicitly just um, integrate the wave in time um, going forwards. Uh, both methods are available in CP2K. The real-time propagation has been uh, implemented in the Ost van der Vondelaes group in Zurich, but we've uh, been working on the linear response, and this is mainly what I'll talk about now. Um, again, I don't want to go in this. What I want to say is that though it's a bit more complicated uh, with time-dependent DFT, the formalism is, is more involved. It has quite strong sort of similarities in flavour to the ground state. So instead of the Hohenberg um, uh, cone uh, theorems, there are these uh, Runge Gross theorems that connect an external potential that varies in time to the density of the system at a given time. And this mapping goes both ways. And this allows us to set up an initial density to apply an external potential and then to be able to follow how the system will evolve in time. And if we do that in the appropriate way, we can extract these excitation properties we want. Um, sort of following this sort of procedure through, instead of an energy functional, there is a, uh, an action functional. And you can show that um, the, the correct solution for your, um, uh, your density should be a stationary point of this functional. Of course, the standard problem with DFT is what is these, or how should we approximate uh, this exchange correlation functional? And uh, in CP2K, we do what pretty much every other code is doing. And we have the um, uh, this time dependent exchange correlation functional is basically the same ground state functional that uh, hopefully most of you are familiar with. Uh, and so this, this approximation uh, goes even a little bit further. So we just say at any given time, the exchange correlation um, uh, potential that the electrons feel uh, is our standard DFT exchange uh, potential evaluated at a given time with the density at that time. And this is so-called adiabatic local density approximation. So th these are the sort of the general um, differential equations. And then there's a standard sort of um, recipe that goes very uh, much along the same lines as ground state DFT. Uh, we have an approximate uh, non-interacting system. We introduce one electron orbitals. Uh, we expand the density in uh, these one electron orbitals um, and proceed in this way. And then we get the time dependent cone sham equations. And then to finally get a computational scheme, what we need to do is introduce not just these orbitals, but actual basis functions for these orbitals. In CP2K, the time dependent DFT, the linear response part of it works similarly to the ground state. So again, we're using mainly as a primary basis set, a set of Gaussian functions. Uh, so these are the basis functions, but we also use an auxiliary um, plane wave basis set for various bits and pieces. Um, so now when we have an excitation in the system, when we apply a, an external field, there'll be some response in the density. And what we expand the density, this response density as, um, the product of uh, some function that is a, a linear combination of the unoccupied states of the ground state system. 
So it's some linear combination at the LUMOs of the system. And each of these combinations um, of the LUMOs is multiplied by um, a wave function uh, that is occupied in the ground state. And effectively, this gives us single determinant excitations. So the, um, uh, the whole state, the, the occupied state that's left behind, uh, multiplied by something that's some linear combination of LUMOs, which is the state that the electron's gone into. So this, this form, a linear combination of these type of orbitals, essentially a linear combination of single determinant excitations. And so typically, um, the excitations are going to look more or less just like a single determinant. And then there'll be a few extra um, excitations. So a few more of these types of pairs um, added in, which give effective orbital relaxation. And again, all this stuff can be plugged in and we come out with matrix equations that look similar um, to the ground state, uh, um, uh, the ground state solutions. And what we'll come out with is some set of coefficients that um, uh, correspond uh, to what these combination of LUMOs will be. And these give us the um, effectively the excited states of the system that we can then use to calculate oscillator strengths and intensities. Um, this is just sort of general theory. How do we actually use um, this in CP2K? Well, if we look um, at these equations, so I'm not going to go into details, but just the actual main terms that are there. For a, a standard GGA type functional, there's essentially two terms here that, um, that, that come in that modify the, the, the transition energies from those of just the, uh, the, the single electron orbital energies. Uh, there's one which, uh, so this red term here, which is a sort of a Coulomb interaction um, uh, of uh, the, the of, of this transition density um, but it's, it's it's a weird mixture it's, it's not a coulomb interaction of the electron and the hole it's th this density here is it is half the electron and half the hole whereas in the, the coulomb interaction which we'll see in a second you've got um, psi squared of the hole and psi squared of the electron so there's a there's sort of a weird cool a weird sort of exchange looking interaction um, and then there's this so-called um, uh, also another kernel term which is essentially the second derivatives of the exchange correlation term. In CP2K both of these terms are evaluated on the real space grids so we have some um, initial guess for these uh, transition densities which will be essentially uh, one electron and one hole so we'll take an electron from the HOMO and put it in the LUMO we will then make a density out of this uh, hole and electron density and we'll calculate this integral on the grid in the same way that the Hartree electrostatics is calculated uh, for the ground state and similarly for the exchange correlation part we've got it on the grid and we'll do that. This is uh, the standard um, uh, uh, time dependent DFT thing for a, a GGA. This was previously present um, in CP2K, but we've re implemented it in a, in a slightly nicer way to our mind. Now, this term uh, originates from the, the Coulomb interaction in the exchange correlation functional, and this term originates from the exchange correlation bit. The the pure density functional exchange correlation bit. If we move on to having um, a hybrid density functional, as well as these terms, we get an additional term, which is some proportion of uh, hybrid, as in Hartree-Fock exact exchange, 
so this is sort of a just a symbolic way of expressing this um, and we scale down the amount of the exchange correlation from the pure GGA that goes in there and this green term when you actually write it out looks like this Coulomb interaction it's the um, essentially a density of an electron in the whole state and a density of a different electron in uh, in, in one of these um, uh, other states. And so effectively, because we've got some fraction of it, this looks like a Coulomb interaction screened by some uh, effective dielectric function. And this being a Coulomb type interaction is long ranged and it interacts um, in sort of all systems and it gives us some uh, interactions even for sort of charge transfer states and so on. So this was physically a very important uh, uh, thing to have present in our system and this is what's been added in. Okay, so that's sort of the general stuff. Now I'll just go through um, exactly what we've done, just sort of sketch out what some of the algorithms are and then show um, some inputs and, and outputs of, of how this, this works in practice. So the original um, time-dependent DFT perturbation theory was implemented by um, Thomas J. Sang. His PhD thesis is available on the University of Zurich website if you dig around hard enough. Um, and that original implementation is still available but what we've put in is, a, is an entirely new rewrite of time-dependent DFT. And this is available under the properties section of CP2K within the force of our uh, section. So previously, the time-dependent DFT was an entire run type. So if you're going to do this, this was the only thing you did. But now being part of the properties section, you can run molecular dynamics or Monte Carlo uh, or whatever. And at every time step, you can calculate um, excited state properties as you go along. Though at the moment, you need to be evolving the system on the ground state surface. Uh, there's a minor point is that the exchange correlation section at the moment is inherited from the ground state uh, calculation. And to get um, uh, well-defined uh, this second derivative kernel term, you need to have smoothing uh, this form on the exchange correlation gradients. I'll show this in the input file in a second. At the moment, we use a very standard block Davidson algorithm. So the, the number of um, possible excited states is the number of occupied orbitals uh, times uh, the number of unoccupied um, orbitals. So that grows very rapidly with the system size. So we can't fully diagonalize um, all the excited states. So we use this Davidson alg algorithm. Um, to say, uh, there's, there's a uh, point, um, well, I've, I've written out later on, but there's, there's several um, uh, regression tests in tests, quick step, and then time dependent DFT uh, two, but um, essentially this linear response should be almost black box like uh, relatively few things to enter compared to many things in cp2k so you add this property section and uh, essentially apart from that property section the rest of your input file should look more or less um, like a standard uh, CP2K input. So properties, time dependent DFT, the number of excited states that you want to solve for, the maximum number of iterations of this Davidson to try and find these um, excited state eigenvectors and values, uh, the convergence criteria, so this is the largest change um, in, uh, in the transition energies of any of the uh, excitations that you're calculating. The only uh, input variable here that's a little bit obscure is this orthogonal EPS, which is 
Um, we're still having a little play around with to find a good default setting for this. But this, this is a setting that ensures that the transition density remains um, orthogonal um, to the ground state. If, um, if we find that um, one of the excited states doesn't satisfy this criteria, um, we don't restart from scratch, but we, um, we rebuild the state um, just to get rid of any numerical noise that's, um, that's built up. There's one more keyword here. There's sort of a repetition of the uh, the, the, uh, the, the plane wave uh, settings that are in the ground state. Um, so we find, and it's, it's been found in various other bits, that for, for this application, you can have a much smaller cutoff than you would for the ground state calculation. Essentially, because we're normally, most of these transitions are from near the HOMO and near the LUMO, and these states tend to be rather smooth compared to sort of the core-like states a lot deeper. So you can get away with a much smaller plane wave cutoff. So you can have a separate setting for the, um, the multigrids here. And so this, this, um, this evaluation of the, uh, the Coulomb term, which uh, comes from the GGA, and the, the, uh, the exchange correlation second derivative term benefit from this, um, this reduction. Both of those terms, I should say, are like the ground state Kumshan build, and they're fully linear scaling. And apart from that, we just need to specify the exchange correlation functional. Uh, here we've got PBE zero. We've got this smoothing uh, on the grid for the derivatives. Um, and, and that's that's about it, really. Um, hopefully, it should just work. Um, for those of you that have run, I don't know, Gaussian or something like that, games, the output should look fairly familiar. If you've got print level uh, to, I think, just low, essentially after the ground state convergence, it will say starting the time dependent calculation. Then there's the steps of the Davidson algorithm, um, timing for the step, the convergence of the, um, uh, so this is change in energy of the um, uh, least converged um, uh, excited state, and which ones have satisfied the um, convergence criteria. Oh, and once it converges, you should get an output that looks more or less like this. You should see um, the state, so the number, uh, the excitation energy, uh, so the, it's got slightly mangled the columns here. There's a, a transition dipole, so you can see in which uh, directions there's a transition dipole, and then there's a total oscillator strength uh, for the different transitions. So again, this oscillator strength is something new that we've added in. Um, this is calculated using the velocity or momentum operator. And so it's not fully tested, but it should work um, uh, for periodic systems. And so after this um, uh, bit summarizing the, the energies and the transition energies, there's another thing which breaks down um, what the transitions are. So in this case, you can see the first transition is from orbital six to orbital seven, so HOMO to LUMO. This one was uh, forbidden uh, for this formaldehyde. Um, and yeah, so this is the main thing. And this excitation amplitude, I think it's the square of the uh, um, coefficient of this single determinant in the, in, in the wave function. So the, the sum of these, um, these no, they're just, just the amplitude. So the sum of the squares of these should become essentially one. Um, and you can control what the cutoff is, the threshold for printing these out. There's a few more examples you can find in this reg test time dependent DFTPT2. Um, I'm probably going on uh, for quite some time, but I say we're also when you're doing this, it's quite important to be able to visualize the orbitals. Um, essentially, there's, there's two options in CP2K. There is 
um, uh, molecular orbital cubes within the print section that give you a, a, a sort of Gaussian cube file of the molecular orbitals that it can view. Um, or we've just put in uh, in an IVO recently, you can output from the SCF section molecular orbitals in the molden format. So you get a single molden file which contains all of the wave functions that you can then visualize uh, within, well, I'm doing it in VMD, there's an orbital rotation, you can just flick through those, or indeed you can use Molden. Uh, this is important so you can go back through, you can see which transitions are which, you can analyze um, what's going on. And so this is sort of a, a summary of that. Um, so we have extended to the hybrid functionals. So we can now use really quite a wide range of functionals with this time dependent DFT. Um, uh, we get a detailed breakdown, which is nice on the types of transitions. We get oscillator strengths and transition dipoles. So this is most of the toolbox you need to analyze um, these excited states. Uh, the cost, so for each orbital in each iteration of the Davidson, essentially we do a, a Kuhn sham uh, build. So it's essentially for each excited state at each iteration of the Davidson, it's like a step of the ground state SCF, but a little bit less because we can reduce the cutoff. So at least if you if you're only after a few um, excited states, you know five to ten or something, then if you can afford to do the ground state, you should easily be able to afford the, um, the excited state calculation. And that's consistent with being able to run ab initio molecular dynamics and to calculate a few excited states um, during the run. Uh, yep, hybrid functionals. We've got this auxiliary auxiliary density matrix method approximation working. Uh, we're now uh, along with a few groups starting to really use this in production, but uh, still in beta, so, so let us know if you find anything weird. Um, it's available in the latest trunk uh, on SourceForge, SourceForge or GitHub. Um, I'll just mention there's one other method we've also implemented, so-called maximum overlap method, um, which is the Delta SCF method rather than sort of configuration interaction. Hmm, that's not rendered very well. I'll, I'll skip over this so we've got uh, time for questions. But essentially, well, for those of you that can read LaTeX, this is, this is fine. Essentially, we, we project at each step in an SCF um, a set of new orbitals onto the old ones, and we keep um, occupying the ones that are the most similar um, to the ones that were occupied previously. And this allows us a different way of trying to calculate excited states. Um, the nice thing about this method, um, it's sort of a complement to the time dependent DFT. If you find a single determinant, essentially excitation, you can do this. You can excite up into that to get a single determinant, um, relax it, hopefully. And then we have forces available um, for those um, for, for these states. So that, that's the only way available at the moment um, within uh, this linear response to get forces. If you use real-time propagation, which is a different way, then there are Ehrenfest um, forces available. But we've got a proposal in to do excited state forces, so hopefully that will come through. Um, thanks for listening to me. Uh, one, wander on. It's a little bit strange for me being sat in my spare room talking to people. I, I hope it's made some sense. Big thanks to Jost van der Rondelay, wherever he may be now, uh, to Jörg, Alex, all CBTK developers, and for the Archer people. Um, I think we've got some time left, so hopefully I've not been talking um, uh, just to myself. So um, if you've got any questions, please either chat away or um, stick on microphones or whatever. Thanks a lot.
just while you're thinking about questions, a um, couple of uh, final slides just to mention whether the uh, recording from today's session will be available on the web at the same URL um, where you logged in from. Um, and there is various other archer related training fields around that area of the web as well. Um, so we'll stick around to answer some questions. Um, there is a, a, a feedback form which would be very useful if you could fill in um, uh, well, what's fresh in mind, um, that would be great. Right, I'll stop talking and let Matt or others talk. If you want to ask questions, you should be able to just hit your microphone button and you should be able to talk. Uh, yeah, so K points are being developed continuously. Um, I think we did we did update the, the stuff on the website um, about K point in the FAQ. Yeah, I, I think I'm just looking at the web page. It says it's been possible to carry out K point calculations since CPTK 3.0, and then the the list below is supposed to capture the current state. I could I'll, I'll maybe clarify that a little bit. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the slides will be made available. I'm not sure exactly where it'll be probably via Archer and CP2K website, probably. Yeah, yeah so we'll get the recording and the slides up, um, I suspect, in the next day or so. Um, so they'll be linked off the Archer. Thanks, Blair. Yep. Uh, yeah, question from uh, David. Yeah, I didn't go into much detail. Um, so this auxiliary density matrix method in CP2K is a way of significantly speeding up the hybrid functionals, particularly in condensed phase. Um, we have that working with time dependent DFT, but at the moment only with, without so-called purification. So you have your wave function in the large basis set, and then you just directly project onto the, um, uh, the, the this auxiliary basis set. At the moment, and I'm not sure if we will be able to do it, we don't have the fancy methods that restore the item potency of the auxiliary density matrix. This, in our tests for small systems, that this seems, seems to make virtually no difference. But um, it, it is working. But um, uh, essentially, people need to carry out calculations and find out uh, how good the approximation is. It's not really known how good it is for excited states in any case. So, uh, yeah, give us a shout. We're happy to sort of help getting that going. Um, again, it sh everything should be working for periodic systems but not very heavily tested at the moment. So any feedback, either yes, it works sensibly or things look dodgy. Um, uh, yeah, just get in, get, in, get in touch and we're happy to uh, uh, help out as much as we can. Um, so I think it's probably fair to say that for most systems, uh, when you're in a kind of reasonably well scaling regime, the pure MPI code tends to be faster. Um, 
so I, I think what you're saying there that you know you want to use it for very large systems um, or uh, for hybrid functional calculations um, which require a lot of memory per process and uh, those are the, the places that you will benefit um, you know exactly how much benefit you'll get from the stuff that we've just done for a GAPW uh, it depends on the weight, depending on the exact settings you're using in your GP, GAPW setup, how that uh, compares to the, the normal uh, GPW parts of the calculation. Um, but certainly now, whereas before there, there was unlikely to be any benefit for a reasonable GAPW calculation, now I think we've got a fighting chance of getting something. So um, the smaller, the, the test case I reported was pretty small and you were getting speed up for using the hybrid uh, MPI OpenP, which is kind of surprising to me based on my um, you know, previous experience. Uh, that's kind of why you're asking the question. Um, but yeah, you, you should definitely see benefit also for large systems. Okay, so it seems the, the questions are drying up. So we'll give you another uh, 30 seconds or a minute or so if you have a burning issue. Uh, you can type in the chat and then we'll finish up. Yeah, so are you talking about the user group meeting? So a couple of people have emailed me um, to say that they, they can't make the meeting mostly because they're not based in the UK. Um, so I'm going to see what we could do in terms of recording the talks or possibly even uh, live streaming them. Um, and I need to follow that up a bit. So hopefully we can do something. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll make another plug for, for the meeting. Please, please register or tell your friends. Um, and uh, Edinburgh in January uh, will likely be cold, but it's still worthwhile to come up. Hi, Rolf. Um, yes, yeah, so Intel compiler and CP2K. Um, so we still have the slightly unfortunate situation um, compared to a uh, G-Fortran, uh, where CP2K is used as a regression test of the compiler, so therefore nothing breaks from release to release. Um, with Intel, generally when they come out with a new release, we test and we find bugs and we report them. Um, so uh, the current status at the moment, we're running uh, the automated regression test service for CP2K using Intel 17.0. Uh, there are a couple of files um, which you need to compile lower optimization, um, but mostly everything is okay. It's certainly much better than the situation was with Intel, say, uh, two, three, four years ago. Um, so what I say, if you are wanting to use iPort, uh, check the, uh, the CP2K dashboard to get a latest working Arch file. Um, but I would also say in practice, uh, there is very little difference uh, in performance between uh, G4 trying compiled binary and uh, an I4 compiled binary because uh, most of the performance dependent parts are now in external tune libraries uh, or in your, your system math libraries. Uh, so it's not such a big issue, uh, I think, as it used to be. Um, yeah, let's finish up there.